kind of have to decide what you think is needed for your story. If you don't know what the sermon is, if you don't know what it's going to say, then you're probably going to have to commit to recording all of it because you don't know when he's going to say something important. You don't know when to start the camera because you have to start it before he says it. You can't start it after he said it or while he's saying it. You have to start it beforehand. So it's probably best to record the, the whole thing. If you knew the sermon in advance, I like got a printed copy of it, you could just look at it and say, oh, he's getting close, and I'll record starting here. But in my experience, I've never gotten a written copy of a sermon. Sometimes on a speech, a political speech, you'll get a written copy in advance. But in a sermon, no. I think most people in a sermon, they make up half of it anyway. So they don't know in advance what they're going to say until it comes out. So, yeah, you would... Um, <clears throat> that's another thing about shooting video. You need to have about twice as much memory and batteries as you think you're going to need. We'll talk, let's talk about this for a second. You need about twice as much as, as what you think you're going to need. So when you go over, you have enough. It's better to come back with things, with cards you didn't use and stuff than it is to come back with two-hour sermons you couldn't record because you didn't have, enough, didn't have enough storage. Excuse me. Also talk about uh, batteries. This works with cards too, but the cards are so big now, it's hard to imagine you'd run out of one. But talk about batteries. It's best to, if you go out, even if it's a short story, something you're going to do quickly, it's best to go out with, with no less than three batteries. Okay, even if they're long life batteries, and pretty sure one battery will last you, go out with three. So if one doesn't work, you still have two more. But the other thing is this, when, you, when you're recording on the first battery, you're recording everything. You just, you got lots of battery power. You get to the second battery, you start thinking, oh, wait a minute, I'm already on the second battery. I need to be careful what I record. You start getting more selective in what you record. You get on the last battery, and then what are you recording? Just only the very, very most important stuff. And you're missing a lot of stuff because you're not recording things uh, that later you might think was important. So if you have at least three batteries, hopefully you'll never get to the last battery, or the last battery all you're concerned about really is not running out of battery. Um, it really depends upon how important it is to, uh, to the story, and how important you think it is to the story. If there's a uh, baptism, and uh, well, let's change it to something else from baptism, there are people swimming, and, you know, and there are crocodiles and the crocodiles attack. If you have bumpy, not very good video of people running out of the water, get away from the crocodiles, that might be pretty usable, even though it's bad quality, because it's probably will help your story to, to actually show the video of people, you know, maybe the camera's shaking, the person's running with their cell phone or whatever. Uh, but if it's, you know, Ted Wilson gives a sermon, and it's shaky all the way through, um, that's a different kind of problem. Because one, it was not, you can't get away by saying it was an emergency, you know, and just, you're just thankful you got the shaky crocodile video. If it's Ted Wilson talking, you probably knew a few weeks in advance, and there's been a, a major human error involved. It's not really a limitation that came from the story, it's a limitation that came from, from yourself or from your crew. So in that case, what would be the consequences of putting up bad video of Ted Wilson? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it would, have, it would have consequences. He probably wouldn't like it, and the people that are with him probably wouldn't like it either. So then you would think, you know, I, I think I'll do my story in a different way so that I can only use the good video of Ted Wilson. So I want to talk about Ted Wilson. Uh, uh, Ted Olson gave a, gave a sermon or something, and I wanted to use pieces of the sermon that he talked about, but I have really bad video from the sermon, or the audio is bad, and you can't hear what he's saying. He says, okay, so what I will do, say the audio is bad. What I'll do is I will use some generic footage of him talking up there, but then I will say what he said. Generally, it's better if he says it, but you don't have that option, so it's, I will say what he said it. So if he says something like, the Adventist church now has 21 million members, you know, uh, the Adventist church has 21 million members, according to world president Ted Wilson. 
you know, so now you've, you've said it for him. It would have been best if he said it, but you're trying to make it work, and it's better than not saying it at all. You're saying Ted Wilson came and you don't show anything that he did. That's even worse than showing bumpy video. So, you know, there's a, there's a call you have to make. You have to decide, you know, where it's at. My, my first experience with, with uh, like professional journalism was right after I got to college. I mean, like a couple of weeks after I got to college. The dormitory I was living in uh, was right on the edge of school, and there was a road. And on the other side of the road, there was a, a large building. And about two days into my first beginning of college, that building burned down. And it was quite a huge fire. It was a very massive fire. So the news media came out, one of the news people came out. By the time they got out there, there was no fire anymore. There was just firemen spraying water on smoke. So they were, so the reporter was walking up and down where people were standing, asking if anybody had pictures. Well, I always had my camera with me, so I had pictures. The pictures, however, back in the days of film, you have to, this happened at night. You have to guess what the exposure is at night because a light meter isn't going to work. Fire's really bright, night's really dark, you have to guess. So the guessing that I was making wasn't perfect, and I had too much motion blur, the shutter was too slow, and there's a fair amount of motion blur. But the station showed my pictures anyways, because to them, even the blurry, kind of shaky pictures that I took were better than no pictures, because it was such a big, dramatic fire. It actually kind of helps. If you have shaky video because people are running from the crocodiles, that's a, probably better than not shaky video because it adds a certain amount of you know, terror. You can see how scared they were. So you know, there's, there's not one answer to it. You just have to think, uh, how can I salvage it? And how can I make the, the video, you know, how can I make it work? And if you can't, you have to be creative and find some way to get a great story without, without it. Again, vid video journalism is different. So you can't go back and you have, to, you have to have all the material when it happens. You can't go back later and get more material. If you need to do both still and video, then, then take two cameras. In fact, even if you're doing just video, take two cameras. Even if you're doing just stills, take two cameras. Because two people can be where in twice as many places as one. So you can get more shots that way. Okay? Uh, there's, there's one exception, may become a bigger exception in the future. If you're shooting on video, if you're shooting 4K, you can on 4K go to like an edit program and you can grab a still off of it. You can't do that with HD because the resolution's not good enough. But 4K, you can pull stills off of the, off of the the video. So that would save you one camera. And that's even better than a, than a still camera then, because a still camera is only going to take a very short period of time that, the, you know, that it took the picture and that's it. But the video camera is going to do a long thing of time. So you should be able to get a lot better pictures that way, because the camera is recording a longer period of time. Okay? So if like somebody was giving a speech and they dropped something, and you wanted to mention that they dropped something, it's somewhat highly unlikely that when you're taking still pictures, you're going to get the item dropping. You'll see people maybe react to it one or two seconds later. We may have somebody like building over to pick it up, but you won't have the thing falling because you didn't know in advance it was going to happen. But in the video, the video is recording all the time, so you, can sh you have a still of the thing falling because you know, it happened while it was recording. Is it clear? Okay. But that's... That's the thing, and even, even some cameras, like uh, wherever my camera went, uh, it has a, 4K, has a 4K mode specifically for stills. So you can record in 4K and you can pull stills off the, off the uh, video that you can use. Okay, the, the interviewees, people you're talking to, should reconfirm or should confirm the facts stated. They don't have to repeat it exactly, but if you say in the lead, thousands were baptized uh, in a stadium, an event run by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and then the next thing down, you could have World, World Church President Ted Wilson uh, had this to say. And then he says, 10,000 people were baptized in this wonderful event, whatever. So he's reconfirmed the fact. You've had an eyewitness 
validate your fact. Does that make sense? It's, called, it's a third party credit. It means another person validated what you said. Okay, this is one hour, about one hour and five minutes after we started. Let's take like a real short break because we're at a break, break point. Like a real short break and then uh, after we've used the restroom or gotten a little water or exercised our legs, let's come right back here. So it is 310, let's be sitting back here again at 320, okay? No kind of idea of what the lead is because then we need, we need to focus the story in that direction. We need to think about that. We need to do, <clears throat> we need to, um, do a story about what the story is actually about. So we don't go out there to the stadium and say you're working, you're writing this stuff down and maybe somebody else is taking pictures. But uh, he's discovered that the lighting is really good in the kitchen and he's getting all these great pictures of people cooking in the kitchen. Like, well, well, congratulations on your great pictures, but I'm not doing anything about kitchens and about people cooking. I may just briefly mention all the logistics it took to put the meeting together, but I don't need all of these pictures about kitchen. So when he comes back and you have, just, you have mostly kitchen pictures and hardly any baptism pictures, you know, that doesn't happen. You've corrected it while you're still out there and can do it, okay? It's very important if more than one person goes out to the story that the two of you are, are in sync with each other. Okay, that both of you know what you're trying to do. Otherwise, you both come back with something different. And then you'll be irritated with each other because the other person didn't do what you thought was the thing you're going to do. Okay, so we have, we want uh, supporting facts. Kind of gets into what, what we've already been saying. If it's a baptism of, of 10,000 people, we want somebody to say that there was a baptism with 10,000 people. Okay, we're gonna say it in the lead, but we want them to say it. Ultimately, we want them, all the facts that we possibly can, which should be all of them, we want somebody to tell us uh, in the story. And what, then what you do is you line up your supporting facts. You kinda of already know what they're gonna be, because you've done this before. You line up what the facts are that you're gonna lead from the story, and you start putting them in an order that makes sense using the inverted pyramid start general and get, get tighter, then say some things, then start expanding out to, to end. So you need to know, uh, I will probably write a lead, I'll write a, a second uh, sentence to support the lead, I will then do a quote, I'll then probably do another quote, I will talk, uh, I'll do what's called a bridge, I'll link one part of the story to another part of the story, I'll do another quote, maybe a fourth quote, and then I'll start ending and wrap it up. So you see, that's kind of what I think the story's gonna be about. I kind of think that's how I'm gonna approach it. When you get in there, you may do something different, but you're probably gonna do something similar, but you need to know that in, in your mind. So when you don't get two life-transformed comments, uh, you know uh, how that's gonna impact your story because you've already kind of in your mind thought how it's gonna be because you really need to do as much of the story in advance of the story as possible. Some people, some people uh, would think that's kind of a strange thing to do in journalism because you're not supposed to do it till it happens, but no, you have to know in advance what you're gonna do. But if it's a soccer game or a football game and a riot breaks out, well, you, you're gonna change your whole story. But at least you were ready for the other story. So you want to get a quote if it's, a, if it's controversial. You want quotes from one side that will say this, you know, this candidate for president's the greatest guy ever. You want to make sure you have people on the other side saying this candidate for president's the worst guy ever. You know, so you get both, both sides of the story. Because ultimately, in a news story, ultimately what you want to do is present both sides of the story and then let people make up their own mind on how they're going to decide. You're doing PR, and we'll get into that, because a lot of stuff we write for the church is PR. It's a press release. That's a, has a different motivation. But for a news story, you want people to say one thing. You want people to say the, the, contradict, the contrary thing, the opposite thing. And then you, 
you, then you wrap the story. You figure out how you're going to end the story. Some of the hardest part of writing is because when you start writing, you don't know how you're going to end. You haven't decided what the end is. So you just keep like writing and writing and writing. You don't know when you've arrived at the end because you haven't decided in the beginning what the end is. But you, you have to know where you're going to end. Okay? So that when you get there, you know when to, when to stop. Yes, sir. Leading with monitors? Yes. I'm not sure what. Leading with more details. Oh, with more. more lead. Okay, how to uh, how to get the right details out of an interview? Okay. I'll talk about that in just a minute because we're approaching interviews. Okay, and we'll go with that in detail. But basically, you're going to do it with leading questions. You're going to ask them questions that will take them to where they're going to say what you you want them to say. Okay, because you want them to say it, but you don't want to tell them what to say because then it's your story, not their story. But we'll get into that. Okay, let's talk about this. All right, th this is very important. This is what constitutes news. People say that something is news. It has certain features to it. And this, these, these are the features of a news story. If it's lacking in, a, in all of these features or in a good many of these features, you probably don't have a new story. So let's understand what the elements of the story are. Not all stories have all these elements, uh, but all stories should have a, a number of these elements. The first thing is, of the seven news values, the first thing is impact. How many people does it impact? All right, the, uh, uh, say a water line broke somewhere and people lost water. They don't have water in their house until it gets fixed. Well, if that affects one house, you probably go, mm, I feel sorry for them, but I need a, I need a story. And there's, there's no story in one house losing water. But if water goes out and it's half a million houses, well, that's a big, that, that's a big story. It impacts a lot of people. To impact one family, it wasn't news, but now it's gonna impact a lot of people, so that is news. Is that clear? Okay, so one is the amount of impact. How many people does it affect? One is uh, the, time, the timing of it, or the timelessness of it. Um, how, re how recent is it? The more recent it is, the more news value it has. If you go to, say, even something extraordinary, 10,000 baptisms in a stadium in Ghana last February, and you printed that today. It doesn't have nearly the impact as it would have in February because time has passed. So it needs to be timely. Also, also would say it needs to be topical. It needs to be news at that time, for that time. So much so that when I worked in news, if we aired a story, I worked the evening news, and we aired a story at six o'clock and aired the story again at 10 o'clock, people would complain because they said it wasn't newsy enough. It was already old. Six o'clock news was old. So it has to be new. So, so it has to be timely. Another one is celebrity value. We already use celebrity value quite a bit today by using, like, talking about Ted Wilson. Ted Wilson uh, speaks at a local church is a news item. Uh, the local pastor speaks at his own church, it's probably not a news item because he does that every week, right? So what changed? What changes is that Ted Wilson's a celebrity. He has celebrity status. So when a celebrity does something, then it's, then it's a, an event, okay? So does, do, do the people involved have celebrity status? Are they people well known? Local is the event nearby. If you're writing about something happening in Russia from Ghana, uh, it's going to be kind of hard because it's going to be hard to get the, the facts. It's going to be hard to get people to talk to, Russians, to talk to you when you're living in Ghana. So probably that's too far away. So for most of you, it's going to be your local conference or union, whatever area church that you're in, that's your local. And the more local it is, the more of interest it has to the people that live there. 
If you notice, local newspapers only like to cover local news. They'll have national news when it's really important, but they really want to do local news. You see, they devote a lot more time to local news than national news. Unusual is a story outside of the norm. It's a famous expression in, in journalism is that uh, dog bites man is not a story. Dog bites a man, that happens all the time. That's not a story. Man bites a dog, that's a story. 